So today I'll talk about uh, mostly what I do as a social entrepreneur, as a community organizer, um, someone who is involved in sports and arts and uses both uh, the unification power of both uh, for community building, social good uh, and volunteering. Um, I will, I have a uh, short presentation, I'll go over it uh, for you to see some images, you know, um, it's much better uh, to show some photographs of what we do. And then I'll just open it, uh, open the floor for discussions. So I think I have a screen share option here. Yeah, I do. Okay. Yes, almost all is fine, right? Yeah, it's, it's all good. It's perfect. Okay. Um, so community building through sports and arts. I began with uh, sports and then moved on to arts. Uh, as Umut said, I studied uh, English literature and philosophy. So I was uh, always involved uh, somehow in, in the world of arts. And I also started volunteering um, when I was in college. So back uh, in Bozici, uh, where Umut and I went to college. So I started volunteering for um, disadvantaged communities in Istanbul. And then uh, I volunteered several uh, you know, NGOs uh, in Turkey, then um, in the US. In the US, um, in Chicago, I volunteered uh, for a children's hospital, children's memorial, um, as an art therapy volunteer. So there I witnessed um, the use of arts and um, you know, the unific unifying power of arts, the healing power of arts um, in uh, therapy uh, in the hospital setting. And then by pure chance, I also witnessed um, the volunteers and staff of the hospital joining a, a climb race. Uh, a, it was called uh, Step Up for Kids. Uh, climbing up one of the tallest buildings of Chicago uh, for a fundraiser. That was a very new idea for me. The year was 2004 and I had no clue you could fundraise through these extreme activities like, uh, you know, uh, triathlons, marathons, these uh, climb up the tall buildings. So I registered for that and I um, got to experience something very new. Uh, so it was a huge challenge, uh, you know, physically and mentally. Uh, it was like 110 uh, stories. Um, and, but then I was also able to raise funds for the hospital and also raise awareness, uh, both in the US, uh, the friends and family I have there, and uh, you know, all the way back in Turkey, people started checking out what the hospital does. Uh, so there I started uh, you know, this journey of like fundraising through uh, sports. And then I registered for the Chicago Marathon. Uh, in 2004, I ran the Chicago Marathon to raise funds for uh, Leukemia Lymphoma Society in the US. And I uh, somehow became a marathon runner. So I was not into running at all until then. Uh, running was kind of boring for me. Uh, it was almost like, um, you know, what you do as a warm up for the fun team sports. <laughs> Uh, but I discovered uh, the, you know, power of the marathon, like as, uh, as a very interesting physical and mental um, training process. And I was able to raise even more money uh, because that was my first marathon. So with that um, idea, I moved back to Turkey in 2005. I was thinking, okay, that's a very different cultural setting, uh, very different civil society uh, scene, but maybe we could start something very similar um, in Turkey. Like how about, you know, starting, um, you know, a running and fundraising um, platform in Turkey. But when I came back to Turkey, um, because I'm an, also an academic, uh, I did some field work uh, with a group of friends and I started finding, you know, volunteers who were interested in the idea. I met some runners in Istanbul, you know, who were like really into running uh, and fundraising. But 
uh, the field work uh, gave me some very interesting data uh, because like first um, the NGOs were not even communicating uh, with the individuals um, because they didn't see individuals as a potential. Um, they all went to the same uh, corporations, institutions and applied for the very same EU funds. And most of their support, like up to 90%, came from those institutions and funds. Uh, they didn't think individuals uh, could bring in any money or could spread their word. And the people, the individuals, on the other hand, didn't think they had any power um, to change anything or to, you know, lessen, um, you know, say, uh, the divide or inequality or do something about climate uh, change. And also they did not trust uh, the NGOs. There was a giant trust issue because around that time we had had some like uh, scandals, NGO scandals, right? Like, so we found out the money raised went to some completely other, you know, purpose. Some of them were used by the, you know, management. Uh, the fund, so there was lack of trust and there was a lack of transparency and accountability in the system. So that's how, um, so we thought like by that time we were, there were six of us who were uh, planning this, uh, you know, event or the platform. We realized we have to do something about both these problems. So we have to uh, make sure the NGOs will work with uh, will be 100% transparent uh, financially, you know, uh, and managerially, everything has to be like 100%, almost radically transparent. And the individuals have to be motivated um, to do something and running would be a really good, uh, you know, like tool to achieve that. So it took two years uh, to do the field work and then come up with the model. Uh, so in the US model, you have running groups under the NGOs. So the Lymphoma Leukemia Society, for example, has its own running group, has volunteer trainers, and all those runners uh, run and raise funds for the very NGO. But because of the challenge we met, we thought uh, our organization, our platform, Adam Adam literally means step by step. Uh, why this name? Not to scare people off, <laughs> uh, because both fundraising and the marathon have to come in like small steps. So not to scare anyone off, we decided to call it Adam Adam. So Adam Adam would be an umbrella platform, uh, making sure all the NGOs we work with are 100% transparent and uh, will be open about all their data. And then uh, we would have our own runners uh, and um, trainers, volunteer trainers, uh, working towards this goal. So the two years went, as I said, for planning, uh, bringing up people and, uh, you know, uh, finding an NGO. And in 2008, uh, so the people you see uh, on this photo, about 62 of us, um, attended the Antalya Marathon. Antalya is one of the uh, cities which has a marathon in the south of uh, Turkey uh, on the Mediterranean. And we were able to raise about 16,000 US dollars for the Turkish paraplegics uh, community. Um, and uh, then, uh, you know, so if you look at this image, like all these people are people we personally know. So six founders and their friends and family. Because this was something completely new, like volunteering as a runner. Uh, so the volunteer had to both uh, train for a marathon and then raise money, which is something very new. Like, uh, you know, tell people what you're doing, why convince them that the NGO is transparent, what Adam Adam is. So we were able to initially convince only our friends and family. That's how we started. I mean, we had a long-term plan, obviously, like a five, 10-year plan, but we started with a very small group of, um, you know, the first circle uh, around us. So in 13 years, now we have about 94 4,000 runners um, and uh, about 120 NGOs. Um, 
and we were able to raise, uh, you know, tens of millions uh, for Turkish NGOs, and some of them are global as well, like UNICEF, uh, from all walks of life, like from uh, sexual violence, an NGO focusing on sexual violence, to climate change, uh, one on uh, refugee rights, to, um, you know, food banks, uh, so very diverse group of 120 NGOs. And um, so we attend uh, about uh, seven, eight races a year and their volunteers uh, run and raise funds. So if you, um, I'll just go through like how we did this, like what tools we use to mobilize these crowds um, to raise funds and become uh, the speakers for these causes. Because the most important thing is like all these people, 91, something, uh, like 94,000 volunteers actually speak up and talk about a social or ecological problem. And they raise awareness among their circles. And they were able to raise the money from uh, 776,000 donors. So they were able to mobilize these people who were not donating before. Uh, so it's it's almost like a, a culture change uh, in volunteering and uh, giving. So what we did was um, we tried to make sure, you know, we don't have like just uh, young, uh, fit people uh, with us running for the marathon. So our oldest uh, member is Safdar Kaltol. He's 93 years old. He's training uh, to be the oldest man to complete the New York Marathon. So he's one of our uh, runners and uh, Tuna, for example, and my daughter as well, she didn't want her picture here. <laughs> and so I have also a 14 year old daughter. Um, so they are our youngest runners uh, who race funds. So it's a very wide uh, range of like runners, you know, from 14 to 93. And we made sure uh, that the platform is very inclusive. Uh, because uh, like social problems and volunteering don't belong to a certain group in society. And the more inclusive we were, uh, the better it was like to mobilize crowds. And also we wanted to make sure there is the fun uh, aspect, like fun and game. <laughs> uh, because like all these people are running uh, for a cause and some of them are very, very sad uh, causes, right? You know, the, the um, sexual violence against children, uh, migrants, refugees. But we wanted to make sure we have some of uh, you know, fun elements uh, when it came to uh, running, because to keep the volunteers, uh, to keep them motivated, right, 90,000 plus volunteers, oh, they also had to be having fun, like it's making an impact, but also uh, having fun. So we always included the fun elements. And we also made sure like they see the impact, like, so whatever they do, like if they raise money to, to, to rebuild a, 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 for a forestation project, for example, here, that's what you see, that they could actually, if they wanted to go there and witness what they've done, like see the impact. Um, I mean, it could be a, you know, Turkish course for Syrian refugees, they could sit there and, uh, you know, uh, attend the course and see what's happening uh, with the necessary permits. So we wanted to make sure they would see the impact of what they uh, ran for. So we have, for example, the furthest project we have is in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in Gambia and Senegal, we do uh, sustainable development projects there. So starting with the water well, then moving on into solar panels, and then farming, you know, microcredits and things. Uh, we even uh, went, uh, a small group of us went to see the projects there. So all the volunteers, if they want to, uh, can... Um, okay, some people, okay. <laughs> I'm ch ch checking that in the meantime. Yes, to see the impact. For example, one uh, of the education units of Tegev. Tegev is a, a you know widespread NGO. They have education units. So it was destroyed due to an earthquake, uh, the one in Van, uh, you know, in um, northeast of Turkey. So we rebuilt it and we went there to visit the kids. So the, we made sure they see the impact. 
So how do, how do the NGOs join uh, Adım Adım and raise funds with us? Uh, so they go to the other platform, Açık Açık, which means uh, openly. Yeah, literally it's open, open, <laughs> but openly. So there they disclose all their financial data. They sign a document called uh, Donors' Rights. They create a profile picture. They upload their impact reports. Uh, audits reports, and then they qualify uh, to run with us. Uh, so it's like a two-way system, right? You try to uh, mobilize runners uh, to run for a cause. They work on community building, working with the volunteers, but also on the NGO side, uh, you want to make sure they're all, almost on the way to radical transparency. Uh, so you tell them if you want these 90,000 people to run with you, to run for you, you have to be completely transparent. So first they create a profile page here, disclose everything, and then they qualify uh, to run with us. So the runner, uh, before the pandemic, uh, we have volunteer trainers, they uh, in uh, very different levels. So we have rookies, uh, we have intermediate and advanced trainers. Uh, so they train the runners and each runner has a, profile page so i'm sure like you're uh, you've seen <laughs> a version of this before because you know many of uh, in many uh, you know um, european countries as well you have a, a very similar system uh, so they have their own profile pages they um, you know just pick the ngo a target um, you know donation uh, amount and also how many people they they would like to raise this uh, from so this was um, this the whole system uh, was like a sales for for uh, nonprofit uh, implemented system, and uh, it's completely now digital. So you just go there and you say um, donate, and the donation directly goes to the NGO, and the runner sees who donated, how much, and the NGO sees all the runners running for them. And uh, from my perspective, I can see all the transactions and everything what's happening. So this is their page. And as you can see, there's some kind of like gamification. Um, so you see, you can increase the amount, decrease it, and then... Um, and there are also like over 300 uh, companies who run with us. So they're corporate runners. Um, so for example, uh, Mercedes, Turkey, Corsa, so several uh, companies form a team. Uh, and find an NGO and start running and fundraising as a team. Uh, so this is very good uh, for companies because it's also, uh, it goes really well with, uh, you know, community building within the company, corporate identity building. Uh, and also it goes into their sustainability reports. So it's a very uh, actually win-win um, model uh, for companies. They can design their own t-shirts, they can do competitions among themselves. And some companies also do matching uh, gifts, you know, so they double or triple the amount raised by um, their employees. So we have like almost half of our runners are part of a corporation or university or a public institution. For example, EU delegation uh, has their running team uh, in Turkey. So. Uh, so this is the sports part, okay? So I've had, uh, I had a chance to have like all this uh, community building, working with volunteers, fundraising, experience uh, through sports for many years. But going back to my, uh, you know, volunteering years, I also have some experience with arts. And what happened was like with, when the pandemic hit, um, I found myself trying to transfer all this experience uh, to the work, uh, to the field of arts. So this is what happened. So this is um, 10 March uh, last year. And so we're uh, at like one of the largest uh, cultural uh, centers in Turkey called Das Das. And the picture you see on the left is taken right after the performance. So we're posing with our uh, active friends, you know, like, and the students uh, from our university, Bilgi, were there that night. So we're posing and all is fine. And a couple of days later, everything is closed. So this was something no one uh, was ready for and no one was prepared. 
And the arts community in Turkey uh, was very similar to uh, the NGO community back when I uh, met them. Uh, so they don't have any data uh, on their supporters, uh, on uh, even like uh, no CRM system, most of them. They don't know who likes them, who comes to their performances. Uh, they live uh, day to day, you know, so. Um, so this is a week later, we are in the same uh, space. So we, uh, and uh, there is a theater cooperative. Uh, I, I, I'm on the board uh, of the cooperative. So 64 Istanbul theaters. And we just came up with this uh, circle thinking, oh my God, what are we gonna do? Because like um, for an unforeseen future, all the theaters are closed and no one has an idea uh, what to do. So the initial idea was let's go to the uh, ministry and ask for, uh, you know, tax breaks or support or something, you know, uh, cancel our uh, rent, uh, you know, like, can we get any help for rent? But it's like everyone is clueless, right? Um, so I, I, I said like, we really need to do some uh, community building and fundraising uh, because I guess on one hand, we can ask for things, support from the government uh, or local authorities, but we really need to, this is almost an opportunity uh, to bring together our communities. Uh, but the biggest challenge was no data, right? Uh, so we tried to get data, like the economic value of theater in Turkey. So no clue. Uh, or how, how many people are actually employed in the sector? How many of them are actually, uh, you know, uh, insured? How many of them are uh freelancers uh you know so all these issues um so i started working with them uh, to gather data analyze the data and how we can actually come up with um fundraising um so what we did was the first thing we did so we were i was organizing uh, a sustainable uh, music festival with the, with this group so we carried the whole thing to online so this was a, the first event we did uh, so the pandemic started uh, 10th of march uh, in turkey so by the 13th everything closed Two months later, uh, we were able to organize an online music festival uh, where, you know, like uh, there, there, there was a lockdown that day. And we used this to raise funds uh, for the NGOs uh, who really needed uh, them to cover um, the expenses for the pandemic and uh, the people who are actually uh, employed but are freelancers in the arts and cultural uh, sector. So it was a free event, but we sold uh, tickets uh, for support. And so we were able to raise uh, over a million, um, million and a half, uh, you know, uh, and we sold these souvenir tickets and we covered the needs uh, which rose during uh, the pandemic, you know, for the NGOs and for the arts community. So there is a uh, platform called Needs Map. Uh, if you have questions, I'll come back to that. So it's a, it's a digital mapping um, platform. So the, the people enter their needs, you know, it's um, verified. And then the, the others who want to uh, meet the needs uh, actually do it uh, on the web. So we had a pandemic special version of this uh, and we used the festival uh, to meet these needs. But at the same time, this was like a community building effort. So people were gathering, uh, you know, around uh, the um, pandemic and raising money. So uh, also we did several, several events uh, for crisis management and community building in the arts sector. Uh, so on one hand, we were organizing campaigns, you know, fundraisers, crowdfunding, but also trying to come up with new ways. Uh, so we organized many events uh, for crisis management uh, in the field of arts and culture. Uh, and most of them ended up with a um, uh, you know, campaign or fundraising efforts and community building efforts. So I can uh, give examples if you have uh, questions later. So a year later, so we were hoping everything would be back to normal by now. 
But a year later, uh, we're still locked down. Theaters are still closed, uh, no concerts, no nothing. Uh, so still uh, the arts and culture uh, sector is suffering, but now we have at least some data. So with my uh, colleagues from our university, we were able to uh, gather uh, data like interviewing um, through like in-depth interviews and surveys from all the theaters in Istanbul and just find out what's happening, what their needs are, uh, what actually they lost in revenue and uh, the challenges. Then we came up with another fundraising event um, to meet these needs. So many of them suffer, um, you know, like um, uh, extreme um, uh, loss in revenue, but they have to pay rents. So again, we pin them on the system, uh, the ones who need rent support and also the uh, workers in the arts and culture uh, community who actually are um, unemployed. Um, and through this fundraiser, we were able to meet their needs. So some people in the community, so it, the, but the community building still continues, uh, the supporters for arts and culture, decided to meet the rent needs of uh, private uh, theaters and some others, uh, the living expenses for unemployed uh, freelancers in the arts and culture uh, sector. So again, we did this through a uh, online festival and the campaign continued uh, later on. So we uh, organized a festival in January, but the fundraising efforts uh, continue. It still continues. So because the rent uh, is a constant uh, need and it's called one rent, one uh, stage. So you cover the rent uh, expenses of a stage. Uh, and the last thing uh, I was involved with um, is uh, a digital platform uh, for arts and culture. So, it's, so this is what it looks like. I'll also post the link. Uh, so it brings together um, artists, institutions, organizations, public and individuals uh, from different uh, parts of the world. Uh, now it's only um, Turkey and uh, Holland, but it's on the way to be, uh, you know, open for all EU all, uh, and then, you know, the rest of the world. And then using the unifying power of arts and culture. So bringing uh, small theaters, small groups with larger ones. Uh, uh, enabling them to work together, share experiences, uh, starting with what's happening in the pandemic, you know, learning from each other, fundraising efforts, um, uh, you know, uh, all the things. And this is what it looks like. I'll post the link. So uh, I'll uh, stop here uh, and just open the floor for questions. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, like if I went through too fast because I mean, these are two linked uh, uh, fields, you know, sports, arts uh, and NGOs and fundraising community building, but it may have been like too intense, uh, but I'm, uh, you know, open for questions, comments, anything. Uh, I'll also post the links. So, I mean, you're, you're talking about you know, all these activities, civil activities uh, in, in Turkey. However, we also, we also know that in you know, Turkish politics, there is this mm -hmm. tremendous turn to authoritarianism. Um, how do you manage mm -hmm. or how do volunteers manage in, in such political circumstances? Okay, so it's a, it's a huge question, Umut. Thank you. Uh, but... Uh... Fortunately, you know, they don't uh, mess with us, <laughs> actually, uh, because like from day one, when uh, starting Adım Adım and building the platform, we made sure it's a politically neutral platform. Uh, so it's all inclusive, right? And we made sure like we're uh, of equal distance to any ideology, because like on one hand, right, there is AKP and the authoritarianism, but on the other hand, there is CHP with like sometimes, you know, militaristic or ultra-nationalist attitudes and excluding, say, Muslim communities and women wearing headscarves. Uh, so from day one, we wanted to make sure we're like not closer to the one or the other, because what's happening is like we are working with uh, several NGOs, you know, like well, some of them are 
raising funds for, for LGBTI uh, plus issues, right? So spot. Uh, on the other hand, there is Çağdaş Yaşam Destekleme, like support for, uh, you know, this like, um, how would you translate? Because they're oh, well, like support, the, supporting the modern life. Modern, but modern in the very like <laughs> problematic yeah. sense. Uh, yeah. So there, it's it's a spectrum, right? So we wanted to make sure, like we we just have standards for transparency, accountability, and respect for human rights. So no one, no NGO we work with could spread hate speech, for example. Uh, once we you know, like set the stage on those uh, premises, actually the government and the local authorities didn't really mess with us. Like they, uh, I mean, so millions are raised, but uh, everything is, you know, accounted for uh, to one penny. Uh, and we don't have a, uh, you know, um, a, like how shall I say, like a very uh, anti-AKP or pro-AKP, anti-HCP or pro, uh, you know, discourse. So no, um, no political uh, issues defended or, you know, supported or criticized. So only social good, uh, but all inclusive social good is um, mentioned. And they really didn't uh, do anything so far, you know, uh from no political party where we like we had to we only had a challenge during gezi park protests uh so some friends here may not know uh so we all know about gezi park protests um so adam adam uh, back then had uh, like didn't have ninety thousand on us but about twenty thousand and we all have our t-shirts so we have sponsors uh, for example now adidas is our sponsor so sponsors give us uh, t-shirts so some uh, adam adam uh, runners went to gezi park wearing the adam adam t-shirts <laughs> and uh, so they posted images of themselves uh, on twitter like then twitter was the thing uh, for gezi and uh, saying you know like insulting uh, politicians and stuff so we had a warning about that and saying Adam Adam is a Gezi supporter. Um, so I had to give interviews, I had to meet people and I said, look, Adam Adam itself, uh, which consists of like say 100 NGOs and 20, 30,000 runners cannot be pro or against Gezi. <laughs> So I'm sure there are other modern runners who were simultaneously attending Erdogan's uh, meeting uh, on the same day. So Adam Adam by itself uh, cannot be any of these. Did you see any official announcement? Uh, no. So, you know, people do anything. So this is something we were very careful uh, about. And so Thank far, you. no other problems. I don't know if I was clear enough, you know. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I, I, I obviously there, there's, there's always a follow-up question, but nonetheless, I'd like to give the floor to Paul and then Andrea. Uh, in, in Scotland specifically, there is a, and I, th I think it's a fantastic idea because we've been part of a network of charities that take part, part in something every year called the Kilt Walk. Um, mm -hmm. And the Kilt Walk across Scotland, it, it's been operating for the best part of 10 years. And the idea is that everyone dresses up in a kilt and walks ah, roughly wonderful. 26 miles for charity. Um, and uh, they've handed out about 15 million pounds in funding over the last decade uh, to different charities of which we've been very fortunate and very much like you said, the organisation registers and then we uh, get a, a lot of people to walk for, for us from, from different organisations. And it's been, the one thing we've really benefited from is for us as a, as a community organisation charity, it's allowed us to link in with corporate organisations yes. who will then in turn give their time volunteering for the charity and uh, do the kilt walk for us. Um, and it, it's allowed, uh, I mean, specifically, I mean, we, it, it's raised over £100,000 for us um, over the years we've been involved and it's um, a massive asset. And um, for anyone, uh, I, I sit on the board of another couple of charities as well and I've made sure to get them involved. Um, because like you said, it's such a fantastic idea. 
Um, it brings charities together. It's a great, fun, friendly event. Um, albeit there's a lot of alcohol consumed in the Scottish ones, as Maggie would probably know. Um, uh, but it's it's a fantastic way for organisations to come together to help communities and help people. And um, yeah, just fantastic. Oh, that's wonderful. When does this take place? Like, I would really like to attend one of them. It's, um, every year, there's, there's typically four. Um, okay. There's one in Glasgow, there's one in Edinburgh, there's one in Aberdeen. Uh, and there's either Speyside or Dundee. And ah, okay. uh, the Glasgow one, pre-COVID, would have typically between 10 and 15,000 people doing it. And uh, and then the Edinburgh one would be second. The, the, they're normally spread out between March and September. Um, I did the virtual kilt walk about a month ago, my girlfriend uh -huh. and I, and we raised about, I think, about two and a half thousand pounds. Um, and it was just because of the pandemic, it was just go out across a weekend and walk 26 miles. Unfortunately, being Scotland, it was very cold and the snow was coming. <laughs> uh, it's, it's fantastic. And I, I think everything you spoke about was, uh, I, I couldn't agree more with, and organisations can massively benefit, and it brings people together of a similar mindset to help different communities. Yeah. And the organisations involved in the kilt walk vary from children's hospitals to food banks to children's charities to, as you said, it's it, it's just a fantastic um, thing for everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I will really look into that, like because we also did most of the runs uh, as virtual runs. Uh, even the Istanbul Marathon, you know, it just, uh, it's a Eurasian Marathon, so starts in Asia, ends up in Europe, like it's a huge event, but they couldn't do the whole thing. So a very few of us, like 2000 actually uh, did it on the course and everyone else, uh, we did a virtual run. But then, as you said, you know, there was still fundraising. <laughs> there was still fun. We used the apps to challenge each other and everything. So the fun went on and the fundraising. So I think the um, sports community was, uh, you know, like they were really fast to uh, somehow adapt to the pandemic circumstances. And so were the arts community, like trying to take everything digital. Uh, and uh, it worked. Thank you. I don't have exactly a question because I'm not able to formulate the question I have in my mind right now. So let me just try to express what I was thinking while you were presenting. Uh, so I start from your, uh, you refer to your experience in Chicago. So I start from there, which I'm also familiar a bit with the uh, third sector NGOs world in the United States, which is pretty different. I mean, from other type of, uh, NGO sector in the sense they have a really professional and uh, mm. a lot of uh, focus on fundraising. And um, most of NGOs in the say, at least from my experience, they have like people working in a stable form for the NGOs, which was really different from uh, the world that was coming to an Italian world of NGOs, at least at the time, I'm talking about uh, more than 20 years ago, which was really more based on volunteering effort. Mm -hmm. uh, starting from that, and then I have to say this uh, model of USA has been, uh, I, I, I see has been imported also in Italy, people, NGOs are becoming more professional, relying more on fundraising as well. And then I want to bring the issues of fundraising. So I just was just wondering, like, whether it's, uh, uh, NGOs and third sector should spend so much time in fundraising. If that mm -hmm. actually is a problem, it, it, I know that the activity of fundraising, you mentioned that also as also as a, the plays or the roles like raising awareness about an issue, for example. But still, is whether it is I wonder it is kind of a, a, a are you saying in English a, this misdirect, let's say the activity of an NGOs. Uh, whether, uh, of course, in your case, it's different because you're just doing fundraising for other NGOs. By talking about an NGO in general, they always have okay. to care about fundraising or looking for money, which actually doesn't allow them to, when you plan an activity, you cannot rely on what's going to happen with the fundraise. I need to make sure what, how much money I have in five years or how much money I have mm -hmm. in two years, how much money I'm going to raise in the next uh, race. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering, it's, not, it's more like a normative question, actually. If this model that we are imposing on uh, the third sector, and you know, is actually correct, it's relying on 
individuals giving charity. I also mentioning this because one of the biggest uh, NGOs in Italy, this was this emergency, I don't know if you're familiar with them, they build uh, hospitals and they run hospital in a place with conflict and stuff like this. Uh, they, they used to, I don't know if they still do that, they used to praise them a lot about the fact that they, they use all the money they get for the actually the activity, not for administration, not even for their structure. They use only like 3% mm -hmm. for the kind of stuff. And they don't do fundraising, I have to say, mm -hmm. because in Italy, uh, part of our taxes goes to NGOs and then people can decide to which NGOs. Which one, right? Which That's one, exactly. You have this choice, uh, which sector of NGO. You want to give to the church or to NGOs? This is the first choice. And then if it's NGOs, which NGOs? Uh, maybe it's because that is different. If we go back to the my starting point, NGOs world is different from country to country. They, they, uh, their activity uh, unfold in different contexts. But then I was, this was, you see, it's not exactly a question, it's just a reflection. I want to know what you think about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. So I didn't know about this, that you could pay tax money, <laughs> you know, as donation, like you also could uh, support the NGOs. I think that's a wonderful system. I want to um, work with the um, Turkish, you know, what do you call them, like the uh, religious authorities, uh, because in uh, Islam too, you, so you, you have to donate uh, some of your income, but uh, they do it for, you know, like only the official, uh, so like either the mosques or during, uh, you know, one of the feasts, they sacrifice uh, animals and send them over to Africa, you know, and I, I'm very critical of these practices. So I want to visit them and say like, why don't you just uh, make an announcement and say uh, any donations to your NGO, uh, the NGO you like would uh, get you equal credit, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's still, uh, I couldn't do it yet, but uh, I want to uh, actually encourage them to come up with this. Um, so going back to your question, uh, yes, the NGOs in Turkey, like they were very dependent, uh, so on uh, either uh, corporations, institutions. So what we start, we wanted to do was to almost like liber liberate them, uh, because if you have, you know, ten thousand dollars, like one of them goes bankrupt, nothing happens to you. Like if you have your own community, so these people are form the community. Uh, because like the person who runs for you also adopts your cause and is really into what you're doing, follows you, you know, comes to other events. We saw a very interesting even uh, outcome, like it, it appeared on our impact report, like many people who volunteered or ran for an NGO actually started working for them or entered their boards. Uh, so it's more like a community building effort, like once the NGO is able to pull these people as volunteers and, uh, you know, donors, then if they're very involved, so we worked on them to, to build a community, like just get back to them, thank them, invite them, you know, involve them. And then they can actually rely on this crowd. Like it's a huge crowd. So you ma if you manage your community really well, uh, you're never nervous about the future because you have a massive community, not like two companies or two uh, people, you know, like who are um, making sure you stay up afloat. Um, so that's been very liberating for most of them, even for the larger ones, because then their community, for example, the, the NGOs who uh, gave scholarships, uh, so we wanted to make sure they just have this CRM system of all the people, like, you know, 30 years, 50 years, they gave scholarships to. And the people uh, who received scholarships now are, uh, you know, running or donating uh, for uh, really like feeling uh, somehow like a, a sense of belonging, you know, an idea of giving back. But this they achieved through first, uh, you know, like knowing where their community is, where they are, what their um, motivations are, and then keeping uh, really in good communication with them, like all the time, you know. So now they're almost like independent from the government, uh, from, uh, you know, these corporations or EU funds. If they get an EU fund, they may do an extra project, but they're sustainable. 
um, these hundred plus NGOs we work with. And this happened through like a very, uh, you know, like thorough uh, community building effort. So that's what I want to transfer to the art sector now, like just very strong ties with a strong community. Um, I know if I was able to answer your question, Andrea. Yeah, thank you.